do welcome everyone this morning. Glad that all of you were able to brave the liquid sunshine out there and uh, make it here safely. Remember, next week is our fifth Sunday dinner on the grounds after our morning worship, and then we will come back and our afternoon service will be moved up just a little bit to about 12.30 or so, uh, as we have in the past. And uh, so be remembering that and know that all of us will enjoy putting on all those extra pounds. Um, and then uh, spending all of those times trying to get it off. But uh, also wanted to mention uh, if you ha did not notice the bulletin board in the foyer, uh, be sure and notice that. It's dealing with our lectureship that's coming up in June on Will Eyes Eschatology. Uh, Sister Nancy Lloyd did that, uh, was it Friday? Uh, came and put that up and did an excellent job on that. We, we certainly appreciate her and the work that she does. I, she also worked in the flower bed some, so uh, so we, we do appreciate her work along those lines. <clears throat> the flowers. <laughs> so they've been replaced. They're new. <laughs> See, people have to tell me these things because I don't know, I'm not observant. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Paul says he forgot to mention the flowers up here. Uh, Sister Dot Dodd, I'm sure, replaced those and uh, appreciate her for her continued doing that. We'll mention uh, all of the ones yesterday that showed up. At the for the door knocking, uh, there were 18 of us here that went out and knocked doors. Uh, took about an hour and a half, except for uh, Dot and Elward. Uh, it took them a little bit longer. Uh, I won't say why or anything, but uh, <laughs> everybody else had already left by the time they got back. But um, they took Henry with them. That's the reason it took them so long. <laughs> but we're thankful that everybody has been involved in that and continues to work along those lines. Uh, appreciate Brother Tim and his efforts along that line and this month uh, getting Brother Carl to kind of be in charge of it since he would be at work. A couple of weeks back, we began looking at the fact that without God, there is no absolute moral standard that is objective in nature. And probably the best passage that deals with this subject would be Judges chapter 21 and verse 25, where it states that in those days, there was no king in Israel. Actually, there was a king, but they did not recognize him as king. Their king was God. But that's another lesson. But then the statement as a result of this first statement that there was no king in Israel, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That truly in a nutshell, represents ethics or morals without God. Because ultimately, everyone is a law unto themselves when there is no God and when ethics do not come from Him. James Ekman, as you'll see on the screen, uh, defined ethics as a set of standards around which we organize our lives and from which we define our duties and obligations. 
it results in a set of imperatives that establishes acceptable behavior patterns. It is what people ought to do. And there's that sense of oughtness, and that word is an important word in this whole statement here because that's what we're dealing with. What should people do? What ought they to do? What's the basis of that oughtness that we are to do? And when we look at that, there are two answers. It is either theocentric or it is anthropocentric. Theos is, means God and centric is centered. And so theocentric is centered in God. When you're dealing with anthropocentric, again, you have that latter part centric or centered in. But then the Greek word anthropos, from which we get anthropology, for example, the study of man. Well, it's grounded thus or centered in the mind of man, anthropocentric. And so there's your two bases for ethics. It is either centered in God or it's centered in man. There are no other choices. That's it. And so when you take God out of the picture, then you're left with that ethics being centered in the mind of man. And so as a result of that, we looked at, uh, spent a couple of weeks looking at anthropocentric view of morality and all that it involved. And then last week we looked at the results of that anthropocentric view of ethics and then res the result is it is the way of death. It results in sin, wickedness, and results in chaos within society itself because as is stated in Judges, every man does that which is right in his own eyes. There are no rules. No one can say that what you did was right or wrong because every man's a law unto themselves. That's the result of an anthropocentric, any anthropocentric viewpoint of morality. The other alternative that we want to look at this morning is that of being theocentric. That is, it's centered in God. And that is based upon the fact that human morality then becomes based upon the fact that God's the creator. God created man. Genesis first chapter, you have the historical account of the creation. It's not a myth as some want to claim, or simply a way to get things started. It is a historical account that God gave to Moses, and Moses recorded it for us, in which God created by his spoken word, we see in Hebrews 11th chapter, this world and all of the things of this world, and also the crowning of that creation, of course, that God created man in his own image. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, it says that God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over all every creeping thing which creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. God created man in his image. That is, after his character, after his likeness. That's the idea that God is presenting to us. And he's dealing with the aspect of the very nature of man and, yes, included in that, morality and ethics. That the ethic of man comes as a result of his being created in the image of God. Animals, doesn't say that about the animals. 
They're not created in God's image, and thus what? Well, animals do what animals do. They act like animals because that's what they are. They are not created in God's image, and thus they act that way. But man, on the other hand, he is created in the image of God, and being in that image of God, you have thus a morality that comes from God. In James 3 and verse 9, James says, Therewith, and he's talking about the tongue here, of course, but therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. And so while Genesis 1 uses the term the likeness of God, and in our image, God says, here James calls it we're made after the similitude of God. There's the nature of man again. And with that nature of man being made after the similitude of God, or after his likeness, we have a morality thus that comes from God himself. And not from the things of this world or from the ideas of man. But since man's, or since God's nature does not change, then the moral attributes that come from God are not going to change. Now then, we're getting into the aspect of, and at least touching upon this aspect, that morals are absolute. They're not going to change. In Malachi 3 and verse 6, it says, For I am Yahweh, I change not. And he adds, Therefore, the son, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. But the aspect of I change not, God saying that, does not mean that he does not change his law for man, because he did change his law for man. It doesn't mean that he is going to change the way in which he's going to deal with man, because that has changed through the years. What's he dealing with? He is dealing with, the, and by the way, let me add this. Some people go to this passage to try to establish that miracles still take place. He's not talking about that. He's dealing with the moral nature of God does not change. I change not. Why? In my moral nature, my character, it's not going to change. It's going to be the same whether you're talking about yesterday, today, tomorrow, a million years from now if the world still exists, or 6,000 year, years ago. God's moral nature is not going to change. It remains constant. And thus that ethic that comes from God to man is not going to change. That ethic that's going to come from him is objective. It doesn't come from within man. And it's absolute in that it's not going to change from here to there. The Humanist Manifesto, when it came out, stated that morals are situational and autonomous. Now, it's amazing to me that intelligent people would write such. Because if ethics are situational, then they are not autonomous. If ethics are autonomous, then they are not situational. It's an impossibility for them to be both. And yet, in this humanist manifesto, they state, that they're both. That's foolishness. And uh, if you go back to the lesson that we had week before last, dealing with situationalism and all of those things that we discussed at that time, you start saying it's not both. It cannot be because they're contradictory in nature. Where do the ethics come from? They come from God. 
And because God is absolute in his moral character, those that ethic that comes from him is going to be absolute in its nature. And thus, for example, certain actions are always going to be wrong. It doesn't matter if you're dealing with the patriarchal age, the mosaic dispensation, or the Christian dispensation. There are certain actions that because of who God is and because of the way in which he made man, those actions will always be wrong no matter what the situation is and no matter what I may think about the situation. Murder, for example, is always going to be wrong. Well, what if man decides that we can murder certain individuals? Or that the situation would say that we should murder this group of people over here. Anyway, that group of people over here, they were a causing the society, our society, to be pulled down, and they were a burden upon society. And so let's just murder them, get them, eliminate them, and we have the Holocaust. That's cultural ethics. And situationalism, the situation demands that we get rid of them. But it's always wrong because the situation, the person, the culture, doesn't matter what it is, it's not going to change God's moral nature. And the morals that come from him as a result are not going to change and it will always be wrong to murder. And when you add, that includes that human life that's in the womb. It's always going to be wrong to murder. Now, that's an objective standard. It's absolute. It will not change. Why? Because God's nature isn't going to change. That's why. In, in 1 Corinthians, and if you turn over to the, uh, well, the first chapter and the start of the second chapter, you have a discussion of a contrast that is being set forth. The wisdom of God versus the wisdom of man. And while in verse 18 of chapter 1, he states that the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Now, why is this the power of God? Because it's the wisdom of God is what he's going to, is the conclusion of it. But notice the contrast that he starts making now. Verse 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. You look at that anthropocentric ethic that we talked about two weeks ago. And all of those different views which are set forth by man as far as an ethical system is concerned. That's the wisdom of man. And he says, I'll destroy the wisdom of the wise. Bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of the world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And you look at an ethical system devised by man, and in reality, it becomes foolishness. Why? It's the wisdom of the world. It's not the wisdom of God. The only way that we can have a sensible society is by using the ethic that comes from God. 
And last week we discussed when you take God out of the picture from an ethical standpoint, the results of it. The wickedness and the sin that we see so prevalent in our society today. Why? Because man is trying to devise a system that is without God and they can't do it. The foolishness of man. God made foolish the wisdom of the world. But now then, let me also go back to the aspect that when you're dealing with this objective, absolute, moral standard, it comes from God. The question then is, how do we come to not have knowledge of it? How do I know that ethical system? Is it just something that I feel within myself? Is it some better felt than told system that I devise in reality all on my own and claim, well, it's the Holy Spirit leading me and guiding me? Or God placed within me this feeling of rightness and wrongness? No, that ethical system that is absolute and objective that comes from God is going to be revealed in the Bible. That's how we come to know that ethical system. That's how we know what is right and wrong. Paul would write in Romans 1, 16 and 17, as he sets forth really the whole theme of the book of Romans, that I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. There's the theme of Romans. The power of God to salvation is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, the therein refers back to the gospel of Christ. In the gospel of Christ is the righteousness of God revealed. God's righteousness what? Rightness and wrongness. God's moral system, ethical system, is revealed in that gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how I come to know what is right and wrong. There's the righteousness of God. And yes, I realize that the righteousness of God, as you, or righteousness as used by Paul, is used in a legal system there, or legal aspect of someone who has been acquitted. Someone who stands in a right relationship thus with God. How does he do that? By the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the gospel is revealing that plan of salvation to us. But it's also revealing to us that ethical system as to how we are to live. And thus... It's the righteousness of God is revealed in that gospel of Jesus Christ. It is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. I know I said, it's revealed from faith to faith. Difficult uh, to understand in many respects. But it's literally out of faith into faith is the literal translation of the words that are found there. You're coming out of faith. What's that faith? It is God's word, the faith, into our faith. And thus, I take God's word into my heart and I apply it so that the just live by faith. The just live by that which God has revealed. Now, why are they just? Because they've accepted that gospel of Jesus Christ and they are living according to that ethic which is found within the Bible. That's why they're just and that's why they're living by faith. They're living by that which God has revealed unto us. That ethic by which He is, re is revealing His will to us. And that by which we are to live. Going back to 1 Corinthians. 
in, again, the first chapter there. Here's this wisdom of God and the wisdom of the world. And how God has made foolish the wisdom of this world. Verse 20. Verse 21, he says, For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Now notice what he's saying here. Here's the wisdom of God. It's made foolish the wisdom of this world. The wisdom of the world does not know God. The way in which God reveals himself to us is through preaching. Preaching of the cross. And that's why he goes on to say then, the pre for the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. And to the Jews, a stumbling block unto the Greeks, foolishness. But unto them that are called, both Jew and Greek, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. When I look at Christ, I see that ethical system that God has set forth for us. I see his characteristics, his attributes. I look upon him, and as he says, as you have, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's dealing with that moral nature of God. And that he is that, Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3, that exact replication of that brightness of God, the express image of his person. Right, I look at Christ if I want to see the Father. And thus, if I want to see that ethical system that comes from God, I have that perfect example in Jesus Christ. So, here's this power of God. Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. Can we say here, God has set forth an ethical system for man that will cause good and right within society as we live one with another. You take that away, though, and what do you have? You have chaos and wickedness and sin. It's all that you have. Now, he goes on, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Look at today. And here's, I talk about the uh, Humanist Manifesto. Uh, the first one appeared in 1933, then the second one appeared in 1973, 40 years later. And basically, our school systems is based upon humanism today. And one of the reasons is, you look at the father of our school system, modern day school system, with John Dewey. John Dewey was a signer of the first Humanist Manifesto in 1933. Now guess what he's the father of? <laughs> our school systems, and what's going to be brought into it, that which he signed, which was a humanist manifesto, and humanism thus. And now then, you have any wonder why we push God out of the school system? Now, teaching an evolutionary system that man is the measure of everything. We don't look for God. These are statements in the humanist manifesto. We must save ourselves and look to God to save us. Morality, while well, we look to ourselves to develop that morality. Don't consider God and his view. And now then we're reaping the whirlwind as a result. The wisdom of man, though, that's the demonstration of it. The man, when he does it on his own, he cannot find a system of morality that will be consistent within society. And you go back to that statement, every man does that which is right in his own eyes. So you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. 
but God had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Look at that moral system that comes from God. And you can see the, the truthfulness of that. Take the Beatitudes, for example, by themselves, and you see something that is totally different than what the wisdom of this world would put forth. <clears throat> God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty and base things of the world and things which are, which are despised hath God chosen, yea, the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And then you go into chapter 2 and it's continuation. Because Paul then now says, I didn't come to you with excellency of speech or of wisdom. What did I came declaring the gospel or the testimony of God? That's not as some have mistranslated this, the testimony about God. It is the testimony which comes from him. What was he doing? He was giving that in this, our discussion at least, that ethical system that comes from God. He wasn't telling about God. He was giving that which came from Him. And so what did He do? For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. In verse 4, I, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, because what about man's wisdom? Why, it's foolishness. It's not going to bring about that society even that is going to be a peaceful, harmonious society. I didn't come to you with uh, man's wisdom, but in the demonstration and power of the Spirit, or demonstration of the Spirit and the power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Yet not the wisdom of this world. What's the wisdom of this world? Sin, wickedness, chaos. Nor are the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But now then notice this in verse 9 and verse 10. But it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. What is it? Man in seeking his own will, his own way, they are not going to come to a knowledge of God that ethical system that God has set forth, man will not come to that ethical system on his own. Man, when left to his own devices and his own will, comes up and ends up with sin and wickedness and things like the Holocaust. Or we can mention a lot of others as well that, came, that have gone through within our, within our world through the years. Man can't find it. Man seeks for it. But man cannot find that ethical system that's right. But, verse 10, there's a contrast. Here's man and he, all of his seeking of these things. Here's man, he cannot come to it. But God has revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. And so here's God's work and the Spirit revealing that will of God to man. The deep things of God. And we say that ethical system by which we are to live. It's going to come from God. And so verse 13 which things also we speak, 
not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. What's man's wisdom? Well, that's that anthropocentric ethic that we discussed. That's man's wisdom. So Paul said, we didn't speak man's wisdom. What did we do? But we speak that which the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost teacheth. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So those things that come from God, from the very mind of God, the deep things of God, that's what they were speaking. And we can, if we had time, we would go ahead and add what uh, Paul wrote in Ephesians, the third chapter, verse 4 and verse 5. And what they spoke, they also wrote down. So that when you and I read, we can come to that same knowledge of, this, of God. And then our discussion, for our discussion this morning we can come to that same ethical system that was revealed by the Spirit to the apostles. And that ethical system that comes from God is not going to change. It's not going to alter. It's going to be consistent at all times and all places for all people. And if you're going to be saved and come into that relationship with God, then you're going to have to obey that gospel of Jesus Christ, that power of God unto salvation. And then you can live according to that ethical system that God has set forth. And next, Lord's, uh, next week, Lord willing, we'll look at the design of biblical ethics. If God gives them to us, for what purpose? There is a purpose. But it is going to, of course, live a, enable us to live in a sociable society. A society that does that which is right. But there is no right if you take God out of the picture. So if you're not a Christian this morning, or if you haven't lived according to that ethical system that God has set forth, then why not? turn away from the ways of this world and turn to God in God's appointed way. That's repentance. Make a confession of your faith that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins. If you become a Christian but you haven't continued in that way that God wants you to live, repent of your sins this morning. Let us pray with you as a child of God to be forgiven of your sins, and God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you need to come, why not do so as we stand and sing the invitation song?